Romans chapter 8. And we'll continue our lesson studying Romans 8, verses 5 through 8. I know we've spent some time right here in these verses. But this chapter is important to understand and for us to learn. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue studying about uh, walking after the flesh, walking after the Spirit, and we understand, Lord, that we as believers can fall into the snares and traps and uh, start walking after the flesh. And when we do that, it's, we're very selfish and it's, it's self. It's all about self and not about Christ. I pray that today as we look at these verses and have a better understanding today of what the Scriptures say, that we'll be mindful that, and be alert and be aware and walk circumspectly. And Lord, we want to walk after the Spirit. We want to be able, be able to communicate with God the Holy Spirit and allow Him to teach us through the Word of God. And we just pray that this time will be a help to all of us in Christ's name. Amen. Looking on the board, I said we can recover from the self-life. And you always hear of people recovering from whatever sickness or different things. But if you look at that self-life and you look at that, that's a large denomination of believers today. It's all about selfie. It's a self-life. And people are selfish, and it's all about self instead of about Christ. And there's a verse, I didn't have this, but it came to my mind. Turn to <coughs> Philippians chapter 2, and verse 21. Philippians 2, 21. If you make a comparison of Philippians 2, 21 and Philippians 1, 21, you'll get an idea about the self-life. We'll read Philippians 1, 21 first. For, all, uh, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now that Christ is Paul's life. Now look at Philippians 2, 21. Paul says, For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Why do they do that? They're living the self-life. It's all about self. So, for us to know and understand what it is to walk after the flesh, going back to Romans chapter 8, what does it mean to walk after the flesh? Well, it means this, that who we are is inside this flesh. That's our, that's our soul. And for our soul to yield to that self-life, and that's, that's what happens, the self-life is driven by lust, it's driven by affection, in Romans 7, 14, Paul says this. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And there's the self-life there. When you live for self, then you're carnal. Paul says, I'm carnal. I'm sold under sin. He's saying there that I'm worthless. I'm helpless and useless there. Uh, so... Did Paul experience functional death? Yes, he did, because of self-life. Romans 7 talks about functional death. He experienced that. Did Paul recover from functional death? The answer is yes, he did. In Romans 8, he recovered from it, and that's why he's saying to walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. So, looking at that, about the Spirit... Uh, remember now, the Holy Spirit's referenced to in Romans 8 19 times. Compared to Romans chapters 1 up to that point, only two times. So, it's important, you're to, it's important that we walk after the Spirit. And that's what Romans 8 is emphasizing there. Uh, the question is, how does God the Holy Spirit communicate with us as believers? And Romans 8 1 says, 
There is therefore now no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. How does God the Holy Spirit communicate with the believer? Uh, by walking after the Spirit. If you don't walk after the Spirit, and we, I must, we know what that takes to walk after the Spirit, and I'll share that with you. Paul says this in Romans 8, 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So we're talking about being led by the Spirit of God. We're talking about in Ephesians 5, 18, be filled with the Spirit. And that's Ephesians 5, 18, but be filled with the Spirit. Well, what's being led by the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, walking after the Spirit, what's all, what does all that mean? Well, we let those words grab hold of our inner man because we've got to take it. It changes our way of thinking. Our inner man has got to be saturated with something besides what you see, what you feel, what you experience, and that type of thing, what people tell you. Your inner man has got to be filled with something besides all, all of that. And we know we want to be saturated with the Word of God. We want to be filled with the Spirit. We want to be full of the Word of God in our inner man. But we won't, we won't, we don't want to use scriptures to fill up our inner man. We want to use the word rightly divided to fill up our inner man. And whenever you rightly divide the word, then you learn that we have Romans through Philemon that are actually written, they're written to us. The rest of the Bible is for our learning. Uh, we read it all, but we build up doctrine in our inner man in Romans through Philemon. And uh, that's why Colossians 3.16 tells us, let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. You want it to dwell in you. You want the Word to be able to read it and let the Word fill it home in your inner man and build up that sound doctrine in you. And that, then it talks about, I mentioned Ephesians 5.18, but be filled with the Spirit. When you do that, you're filled with the Spirit. And you walk after the Spirit. You communicate with the Spirit because the Holy Spirit can't communicate with you unless you're in the Word. And, it, and it's, it's one thing to be able to open up a Scripture and read it, but it's another thing to use the Scripture rightly divided and build up that doctrine in your inner man to allow God the Holy Spirit to communicate with you. And... That's what people don't understand. Uh, you know, God the Holy Spirit wants us to know the certainty of the words of truth. The certainty of the words of truth. And I want to share that with you. Turn to Proverbs 22 for just a minute. God the Holy Spirit wants us to know the certainty of the words of truth. Proverbs 22. And we'll look at verse 21. How about the certainty of the words of truth. And we're going to find out what certainty means. And we're talking about the certainty of the words of truth. The, I should ask, are the words of truth certainty? And yes, they are. And that's why God the Holy Spirit wants us to know the certainty of the words of truth. Proverbs 22, 21. I found this verse from studying this week. That I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that sinned unto thee. Notice the certainty of the words of truth. And he said there, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that I, that I mightest answer the words of truth to them that sinned unto thee. So we're talking about the certainty of the words of truth. And we're going to let the Bible tell us what that means. And by saying that, turn to Luke chapter 1. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the certainty of the words of truth. Luke chapter 1. And in Luke chapter 1, <clears throat> we'll get an understanding of what certainty means. Luke chapter 1. And again, we're talking about uh, the certainty of the words of truth. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 1, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they deliver them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers to, of, of the word, 
It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, from the very first, to write unto thee in, or to thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. If you compare, read verse 1, Luke 1.1, 1, 1, and verse Luke 1, 4, what does the word certainty mean? It means surely. You see that in verse 1? For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth an order of declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. And you read verse 4, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So certainly is surely, surely believed there. And, and, and you, you think about that. Now turn to Acts 26 and see what Paul says. Acts chapter 26. And Acts 26 and verse 25. Acts 26, 25. As I mentioned, we can recover from the self-life but you've got to use the certainty of truth, the Word of God, to do that, to allow God, the Holy Spirit, to teach you and you to be able to communicate with the Holy Spirit of God and learn what the truth says. So in Acts chapter 26, verse 25, Paul said, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak, speak forth the words of truth and sober, soberness. The words of truth, surely, I mean, they're, they're sure. The words of truth are sure. They're, they're surely there. So the question is, did Paul have any enemies? And we all know he did. He had so many enemies, they put him in jail and wanted, wanted to destroy his flesh and all that type of thing. Do you have any enemies today? And the answer would be, yes, you do. You, and you, you're fooling yourself if you say, I don't. Well, why would you have enemies? Well, I'll tell you why I have some enemies, because I stand for the truth, rightly divided. Now that would do, cause people to become my enemy. Friends become your enemies because you take a stand for the truth. Now that, that's the simple fact about it all. Turn to Psalm 119 and 139. Psalm 119 and 139. This is an interesting verse about enemies, Psalm 119 and 139. Why do you have enemies? Why do friends say they're your friends and automatically they turn against you when you stand for the truth? Why does your family say they love you and they say, you know, I'm saved just like you, but when you stand for the truth, they turn away from you. Why is that? Well, Psalm 119, 139, My zeal hath consumed me, because mine enemies have forgotten thy words. So you can just count on that when people turn against you, they've forgotten the words, the word of God, thy words. And if people don't read the word of God, and you give out the Word of God to them, don't think, hey, they're just going to believe everything I say, and they're going to do it just exactly. I'm all excited about it. That's not always the case, because they turn against the words. Notice there, because mine enemies have forgotten thy words. You have to remember that a lot of people today, it's, a, it's about self, the self-life, and when it's about self, a lot of people don't read the Bible. And when they do read it, they don't rather divide it. And so when you have that, and you, you're, you're dealing with people like that, you can't take it for granted, hey, they're going to, everything I say, this is going to be a real big winner right here. The Word's going to really get a hold of them, and they're going to change. And that's not always true. They've got to have a will and heart and mind to do that. So, I, I can say, what should we be doing as believers with the Word of God? We ought to just keep saturating our inner man with it. I mean, filling up our soul with the Word of God. And what does that do? 
That allows God the Holy Spirit to teach us through His Word. And that, that's the importance of reading. Because you're allowing the Holy Spirit to teach you through the Word of God. And that's why if we don't allow the Word in our inner man, the Holy Spirit can't teach you. And that's why so many people today are living that self-life. Because they, they don't want the Word. Uh, and when they do, it's, it's not a very lengthy time. It's just a, you know, enough to kind of satisfy their conscience a little bit. But we need to saturate our inner man with the Word of God. To allow the Word of God to teach us. To allow the Holy Spirit to teach us. So, you think about how is sin going to deceive us today as believers? Well, the sin will do that by your affections and your lust and all that. And it will do that. So we're going to consider a believer today walking after the flesh. And I've learned this. When you walk after the flesh, that's that self-life. It's all about self. So first of all, consider a believer walking after the flesh. Look in Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. We'll use the scripture to do this. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. We're talking about walking after the flesh. We're going to consider a believer walking after the flesh. Why do believers walk after the flesh? Why would anybody want to do that? Well, Romans 8 5 says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. Well, when you mind something, you've got your mind on the flesh. And when you walk after that flesh, it has to do with the self life. How is it that we operate? How does the self life operate with any of us? Well, we, we, we want to do, it's our strength. It's about my strength, what I can do. And it's about not only my strength, my effort. You know, people say, well, I've made an effort. I made an effort to, like in my case, I made an effort to go to school, to Bible school. But everything I got there didn't help me. But just because I went there doesn't mean, hey, everybody owes me. No, they don't owe me. What I've got to do, I've got to recover myself from the self-life and find the truth. And the only way I can find the truth is by, whereby when you read, you may understand. I'll read the Word of God, write the divided, and come to the knowledge of the truth. It's got to be that way. So it can't be about my strength or my effort. It can't be about my thinking or my thoughts or my opinions. And that, that's why to walk after the flesh, our soul yields after the self-life. That's what we do. When I, for me to walk after the flesh, I'm allowing my inner man to yield to this flesh. And this flesh is nothing but a vehicle to, to drive around in for my soul and spirit. So... Sin operates in the, in the realm of I, me, myself. And whenever you hear a lot of people always talking about my, themselves, you know they're selfish. They're, they're, it's a self-life. And, and that's what they're doing. And when that happens, whenever you, you, you become selfish and it's a self-life, you know what you become? You become the final authority not the Bible. The Bible should be the final authority. But no, when people are to live the self-life, they, they're doing it on their own strength, their own effort, their own thinking, and all that type thing. And when they do that, they become their final authority. So that tells you something, walk after the flesh. How, how does a person look as a believer walking after the flesh? And I can say this, they look like a dead person. A dead man or an unsaved man. I mean, you, you think about <clears throat> the actions of people. I, I know we were in a restaurant this past week, and I, I got up and came back, and, and Connie said, "Whisper said they're fussing back here behind us." And I listened for a minute, and I told her, "I'm ready to go." You know, I've had enough of that, so I'm not interested in what they got to hear, what they got to say, and all that type of thing. But it's a self-life when you do that. Selfish. And 
what God is doing is not going to function to our, in ourself in your life. When you're selfish, what God's doing today will not function in your life. And that's what believers may not understand. Most likely they don't understand. Hey, for me to be selfish and live that self-life, then what God's wanting done today and what's going to be done, it won't function in my life. Now that's, so that's, that's the part. You know, people, are always, they always think about, well, you know, what if I just quit and, you know, don't uh, want to work in the ministry and all that? <clears throat> well, there's always somebody else. And I've found that true in the last, all these years. There'll be somebody else that will step up and take that person's place. And guess what? That person's going to miss out on the opportunity of serving and living and doing the work of the ministry. So it, it's, a, it's a choice that individuals make and looking in Romans chapter 8 now at the second thing about as far as walking a believer, consider a believer walk, walking after flesh, Romans 8, 6, it says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So the next question is in verse 6, how does walking after flesh affect a believer? How would it affect you if you're walking after flesh in verse 6? Well, it says, For to be carnally minded is death, so, automatically, you know, when you're carnal, when you're walking after the flesh, and say you did pick this up here, uh, you read the Bible, and you read carnally minded, and you'd say, well, what is that? Then they say, is, is death? Well, I can't be doing that because the Lord is not going to take me and I'm going to die. That's the type thing that the religious system preaches. But the verse how does walking after the flesh affect a believer? Well, carnally minded is death. And when you've got death in a believer, it's talking about functional death. And that's, that's something there. There's no purpose in your life when you're like that. You can't function when you're carnally minded. You're walking after the flesh. You, you're not serving. You're not doing the work of the ministry. You're living in the world. And really, you're living like the world for the most part. So, what happens to uh, functional death there, you become dependent upon yourself. You know, there's verses like in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A lot of people will pray that verse and when they've got to go to a meeting or give a presentation or talk to somebody, Lord, I'm just praying you'll give me strength. And they're really wanting bodily strength. They're wanting to be able to go and stand and Lord open my mouth and all that type thing. And, and what they don't realize, that strength, the strength, it's inner man's strength. And you can't get inner man's strength unless you read the Word of God and study it and allow God the Holy Spirit to, to teach you. So, you know, when you can't function as a believer, you're walking after the flesh, you become, to, you become dependent upon self. You, you're obedient to the flesh. Whatever the flesh wants to do, that's what we want. That's what we want to do. And exercising loyalty to the flesh, to that self-life. You know, there's people today, they're so loyal to their church, regardless of what's being preached, regardless of what they stand for, this is where I've been all my life, and this is where I'm going to be until I die. So that's loyalty when, when people are like that. But on the other hand, other hand, you think about all the believers that exercise loyalty to self, to the flesh. It's just all about me. You know, it's not anybody else. It's, it's all me. It's self-life. I deserve it. I should have it. And I should be doing this, that, and all that. It's all self-life. And that's, that's religion wants you to be better. They want you to be a better I am. Me, myself, I. That's what religion teaches. So, that's how, how a believer walking out the flesh, that's how it affects your life. I mean, I know now, I, I'm not going to say how much I know, but I, I'm going to say I am growing in the Word. But I know now enough to be able to say I don't want this flesh to affect my life. Even though it does. Certainly all of us. 
but we don't want that to affect us here in this assembly. Now, looking at another thing about considering walking after the flesh, Romans 8, 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, when you look at that verse, why can't a believer walking after the flesh please God? You can, you can ask yourself in Romans 8, 7, why, if I'm walking after the flesh, why wouldn't that please God? I'm saved, so... You know, if, why wouldn't it if I'm uh, not reading my Bible, I'm, I'm not studying, I'm not doing the work of the ministry, I'm walking out there, I'm just doing whatever I want to do. Why would it not please God? Well, it says that, it says in Romans 8, 7 there, because a carnal mind is enmity against God. So you think about a carnal mind, it's an absolute, total rebel against God. That's what it is. It's rebellion. And, and that's why uh, you think about a believer that just lives after the flesh. They rebel, they become disobedient, and they go contrary to the doctrine. And that, and that means this. I mean, a believer can be sitting in, in their congregation and not rather divide the word. Well, what are they doing? They're walking after the flesh. They're going contrary to the doctrine. And you can tell somebody about how the Bible is, it's a, you study the Bible by timeline. Time passed, but now, ages to come. That's Ephesians 2. And they'll look at you and they'll say, well, I don't know about that. Well, you know why they say that? Because they're rebelling. It's a, it's a self. It's all about self. That's what they're, that's what they're doing. Rebelling, they're disobedient, they're going contrary. That's why when you talk about, you tell people, well, you need to follow Paul and not follow the twelve apostles. And they'll look at you and they'll say, I don't believe that. Well, they're contrary to the Word of God. They're rebelling on it. They've got a carnal mind and that's what the carnal mind, uh, the, the, because the carnal mind is the enmity of God against God. I mean, they're rebels against going against doctrine. And that's, that's what I'm, I'm giving you to try to help you to understand about people. They're contrary, they're opposite to the doctrine. Now, you'll say, well, are they saved or not? Well, all you know if they say they're saved, that's all you know. But if, I do know this, if they are saved, they're walking after the flesh. I'm not judging, the word is. And I also know that some go even as far reversion and they act like a lost person. Can't tell the difference. So, we learn that from the Bible, so don't let all this surprise you when, when you're dealing with people. I made a comment coming down here, I'm not surprised at anything now that I hear. You shouldn't be. Because the thing, we're living in perilous times, and things get worse and worse. People are ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what you're faced with. It's not a matter, you'll say, well, what's the use to try? Because grace motivates us. And we, because we, the, we value and love the Lord for what He's done for us. He loves us far more than we love Him. And I want, I want to do the work of the ministry. It's our job not to win the world. It's our job to give the gospel out. It's our job to give the truth out to believers and, and, and tell them what the truth is. So, what will happen to a believer's work at the judgment seat of Christ? Now, I'm going to hit a little bit about the judgment seat again. I know I did last week, but I'm going to use a few things a little bit different. What will happen to a believer's work at the judgment seat of Christ? We'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll, we'll start in verse 10. Now, we're talking, we're talking about carnal believers. We're talking about believers that are saved and they're walking after the flesh. So what's going to happen uh, to a believer's work at the judgment seat of Christ? Well, 1 Corinthians 3.10 According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Now that makes it clear who laid the foundation for us. Paul did. And another buildeth their own, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. And you can go to Ephesians 3, and we won't do that for the sake of time, about the grace of God was given to Paul, and, and all. 
and ballot that we should follow Paul. But there, there's two, when you think about this here, about building, I've laid the foundation. I've laid the foundation and never built their own, but let every man take heed how it built their, their own. By saying that, turn to Romans chapter 15. Romans 15. Take heed how you build their own. Romans 15. And look at verse 20. We're talking about believers now. We're talking about believers that walk after the flesh. And what's going to happen to a believer's work at the judgment seat of Christ? Well, it's important for all believers to build on the foundation Paul laid. He laid the foundation. We build on that. And Paul says this about don't build upon another man's foundation. In Romans 15, 20, Yea, so I will strive to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. You see that? Paul's concerned. He didn't want to build upon another man's foundation. Well, 1 Corinthians 3, 10, according to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another built thereupon, but let every man take heed how he built thereupon. Now, here's the thing about a believer, a carnal believer or any believer, We've got to build on the right foundation, the foundation that Paul laid. Paul was quick to tell you he didn't build upon another man's foundation. Well, what other foundations were they out there to build on? Well, you've got the foundation that the 12 apostles, they laid. And you think about the gospel of the kingdom they preached. Paul didn't want to build on that foundation. We don't want to build on that foundation today either. Because if you build on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John early part of Acts, then in your inner man, well, you're going to suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. Whether you're carnal or where you're walking after, or you're, well, you're carnal, if you're, if you're not rightly divided or true and walking after the Spirit of God rightly divided, then there's carnality there. I mean, it can't be anything else. So, by saying that, Paul gives you something about the, the gospel in Romans 15 there in verse 19. Paul preached the gospel of Christ. The twelve apostles preached the gospel of the kingdom. But notice something in Romans 15, 19. Though mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, I'm sorry, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now, you think about the gospel of Christ, what two things are revealed in the gospel of Christ? When you think about the gospel of Christ, where would you go to talk about the gospel? We're talking about the gospel of Christ. We go to 1 Corinthians uh, 15. And we, I'd like to share this with you, 1 Corinthians 15. And we're talking about the gospel of Christ. Well, we know what the gospel is. And we'll read that in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And I want to give you what two things are revealed in the gospel of Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered to you first of all, all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, if you're looking at work, two, what two things are revealed in the gospel of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. No doubt the first thing is that Christ died for our sins. That's the first thing there that you've got to look at and consider that's revealed the gospel. That he died, for, uh, he died for our sins. But you'll notice that I'm reading that according to the Scriptures in verse 3. Verse 4, according to the Scripture. That's the second thing. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The Word of God tells us that He died for our sins. And don't never let anybody tell you it otherwise. I mean, the Word of God's right. That's the final authority. Man's wrong, and he died for our sins. And it's the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1 16, by the way. Uh, so, going back to the judgment seat of Christ, a believer, whenever you hear the gospel, you're saved, you believe the gospel. Well, 1 Corinthians 3, going back over there, Paul t tells us. The question is, what happens to a believer at the judgment seat of Christ who has walked after the flesh? They're saved. They have believed the gospel that Christ died for their sins. 
They didn't pray and they didn't confess, but they believed the gospel and they trusted Jesus Christ exclusively in Him alone. And when you do that, you're saved by grace. And so here we are, whether we're walking after the Spirit or after the flesh. So what happens to a believer at the judgment seat of Christ who walks after the flesh? Well, 1 Corinthians 3.10 talks about, Paul said, I laid the foundation and another built their own. So we know we don't want to build on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or Peter, James, and John, those apostles. We want to build on the right foundation that Paul's laid. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 3.15 there. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. A lot of people, they want to talk about works, works, works. The Bible says work, singer. See that? If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Well, hold your place there and go to 2 Corinthians 5, 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. And this verse really helps you about the judgment seat of Christ as a believer. Let me ask you as you turn to 2 Corinthians 5, 10. When Christ died on the cross, did he die for all your sins? Past, present, and future. The answer is yes. So that if he died for all my sins, it's obvious I'm not going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ for sins. Well, 2 Corinthians 5, 10 helps us. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, what's the intent and purpose? You see that little word, that? Paul says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Here's the purpose, that. Notice that, that there. Everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he done, whether it be good or bad. Well, you're already up in the heavens. You've got a new body. So it can't be done in your, in your, in your new body. Your flesh is already gone. And now you're, you, what's in your body? Things done in his body. The, the only thing you've got in your body is your soul. And so the work that you've put in your soul is what's going to be judged as judgment seat of Christ. And it's very obvious that a, a carnal believer is not putting anything in their inner man. Think about that. So what happens to them at the judgment seat of Christ? They're not putting anything in their inner man. And you're going to be judged uh, uh, according to what you've done, whether it be good or bad. So... Going back with that in mind, go back to 1 Corinthians 3.14. 1 Corinthians 3.14. If any man's work abide which he built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. For something to abide, you, you've got edification, you've got sound doctrine built up in you, Romans 2.5. Rightly, you're rightly dividing the word, you've got that built up in you, You've, you've been walking after the Spirit. You've edified. You've built that house of doctrine in you. You're going to receive a reward. But on the other hand, a, a believer that walks after the flesh and doesn't build up the inner man, verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be burned up. What the selfish life that what man puts in his inner man will be wood, hay, and stuff. You know, the doctrine is what you're building up in you. I mean, it, it, the selfish life won't have anything there, really. I mean, it, they may be a little bit there to start with, and then they quit. You know, it's all about self and that, that selfish life. So, what's the result of all this? Well, 1 Corinthians 3.15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Well, what kind of loss is he going to suffer? Well, he's going to suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ whenever we're presented to God the Father after we're at the judgment seat of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ takes us in the throne room of God. We're presented to the Father, and the Father assigns us our duties in heavenly places. Colossians 1, 16 tells you. talks about the government and all that. So you suffer loss that way as far as reigning in the kingdom positions of rank and authority. You lose out on what you could have had. And not only that, but you're losing out now. You're, you're, the grace life is teaching you who you are in Christ. 
and you're, li you're losing out on who you are in Christ now, and you're going to be up in eternity forever talking about uh, who Christ is and what He's done for us and glorifying Him. So it makes sense. Why don't we do it now and not let self interfere and, and, get, and get in our way? So we can recover from the self-life, and that's by considering what Paul says, reading the Word of God, believing it, what you read, study it, rightly divided, and following Paul. Walking after the Spirit. And when you do that, you can recover from it. So the conclusion is, we can recover from the self-life and to know and understand what it is to walk after the flesh. I don't want to walk after the flesh. I want to walk after the Spirit. I'm, I'm thankful today that what Christ has done for us. I'm thankful that we're saved. I'm thankful for our local assembly. We have the truth. We have the Word of God rightly divided. And we're walking after the Spirit. I, I'm thankful for that today.